Good evening to you all. And uh, hello. Whoever said hello. How are you doing? Hiya. <laughs> well, it's been a good day and a lot of activity and a lot of physical activity. And we've had a uh, tea as well, a lot of food to eat. Uh, but this subject is very serious. And what I hope and pray with all my heart that this isn't just going to inform you or shock you, which I hope it will, but that you will be listening with the right ears, not just the easy ears today, uh, but the ears of your heart, those that know the Lord. And if you don't know the Lord, that maybe the Lord might use this just to shock you as to what is going on in the world in which you live. And things you'll be very surprised to hear about or see is taking place and where it is all heading. So, you know, because maybe we've had a lot of conversations and discussions and running about and all the rest, maybe we just need to still our hearts. I need to still my heart again before the Lord. And then we will launch into this subject, a Goliath in the church, Christian Palestinianism. That is a term the Lord gave me, I believe, a few years ago. And I'm using that to describe to describe or define Christians, those who call themselves Christians, who are on a crusade against Israel. It's not a group called the Christian Crusaders. I'm saying these are Christians who are crusading against Israel. Just up. Okay. Right up. Attach it to my chin if you like. <laughs> oh. Oh, nope, that's not a good idea. Maybe if I button is that better? Okay. <laughs> Where's my mum when I need it? <laughs> right, we're okay. Technically we're okay. Okay. A little bit of feedback there. Well, let's commit it to the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, you are our God. You are the Creator. You are the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you are the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we worship you. And Lord, after a long day, after a busy day, after a lot of different activities and a lot of really important teaching, Father, we just want once again to still our hearts in your presence to come before you, Lord Jesus, and to pray that through your Holy Spirit you would speak into our inner ears, Lord, that we would hear whatever it is that you would want to speak, say to each one of us tonight. Lord, we need you. We need your protection even over this session, Lord, and we just ask your protection over our families and our churches back home. I we'll pray you bless them, Lord. And Father, above all else, we pray that if there are any that even now in this session, do not know you as their God, do not know your Son as their Savior, you would draw them to the cross, you would draw them through your cords of love and through the conviction of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Palestinian cause. All you need is to have a minimum of decency and ethical perspective. You don't need anything else. the United States. These apartheid wall demonstrations against Israel organized by the Muslim Students Union. Remember that last question that that lady asked. How many of you just became Palestinian? Well, Jesus just did. Christmas Eve 2010, Palestinian Media Watch, an organization that uh, monitors what's going on in the Palestinian territories, what their Muslim clerics, their political leaders are saying, ran this headline, Jesus was a Palestinian. No one denies that, says Palestinian Authority TV. You have a Palestinian author, Sami Ganadre, describing Jesus as the first Palestinian shaheed. A shaheed is a martyr. A shaheed is somebody who gets on a Jerusalem bus and blows themselves up to kill as many Jews as possible. Jesus was the first Palestinian Shaheed. You're going to hear now from this man, Mustafa Barghouti. He ran for the presidency of the Palestinian Authority at the same time as Mahmoud Abbas. This is his interview. You can watch this on YouTube. Palestinian Authority TV, 24th of December, 2009. Unless you speak Arabic, you will not be able to interpret what he's saying, but the translation is at the bottom. ولكن نحن نتذكر دائما بأن السيد المسيح كان الفلسطيني الأول الذي عذب في هذه الأرض. Jesus was the first Palestinian who was tortured in this land. Tell me, please, who is Jesus? What nationality is the Lord Jesus? He's Jewish. We all understand that. He was born a Jew. He was raised a Jew. He lived as a Jew. He ministered as a Jew. He was crucified. King of the Jews. He rose from the dead as a Jew. He ascended back to the Father's right hand as a Jew. How is he coming back to planet Earth? As a Jew. King of Israel. King of kings. Son of God. Sheikh Mohammed Hussein. This is the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. The Grand Mufti is the head of the Supreme Muslim Council that oversees the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. This again is Palestinian Authority Television, May the 12th, 2009. And Sayyidina Masih alayhi salam wulida fi hadhi al-diyar wa daraja fi hadhi al-diyar wa bashara bidawati fi hadhi al-diyar fahwa wa ummu yani nastati' al-qawl annahuma filistini yani bimtiyaz. Jesus and his mother Mary were Palestinians par excellence. So the Muslim world, the Islamic world are making Jesus one of their own because they have an agenda. Okay, we may not be surprised by that. Let me just make a point. It's very obvious, but it needs to be made because many in the church don't get this. The Jesus of Islam is not the Jesus of the Bible. The God of Islam is not the God of the Bible. Allah is not another name for God. Allah is the name of a demonic God that was worshipped in Mecca that Muhammad embraced and called the God, the Creator. That is so important that we understand that as Christians because there's a lot of confusion in 
the church. Just because Jesus is mentioned in the so-called holy books of other religions doesn't mean it's referring to the same Jesus Christ that you read about in the New Testament, that I hope most of you are worshipping as your Lord and Saviour, and that all of us, if that isn't all of us tonight, all of us by the end of Truth for Youth will come to acknowledge as our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. So that was the Islamic world. Let's go into the church. This is Naim Atik. He is a Palestinian clergyman within the Anglican Church. I've described him as the chief architect of Christian Palestinianism. 1994, Naim Atik founded an organization called Sabil. Some of you know about Sabil because you've read different reports and heard the testimonies that I've shared in the past. Sabil represents the Palestinian Ecumenical Liberation Theology Center. And I've not got time to unpack that, but hopefully those words will flag up, well, warning bells will be going off, red flags will be going off in your mind. Palestinian Ecumenical Liberation Theology Center. This is the peaceful response to the so-called Israeli occupation. Hamas, you've heard of Hamas, the Palestinian terrorist organization, founded in 1987 to destroy Israel. Well, it wasn't long afterwards that the so-called Palestinian church decided to establish their own peaceful resistance, non-violent resistance to the so-called Israeli occupation. Naimati, Jerusalem, Easter, Passover, 10th of April 2001. Some of you have heard this and read this. This is what he had to say, a clergyman in the Church of England in Jerusalem. Here in Palestine, get these words, you know, let them alert you to what's going on here. Here in Palestine, Jesus is again walking the Via Dolorosa, the way of the cross. Jesus is the powerless Palestinian humiliated at a checkpoint. The woman trying to get through to the hospital for treatment. The young man whose dignity is trampled. The young student who cannot get to the university to study. The unemployed father who needs to find bread to feed his family. In this season of Lent, it seems to many of us that Jesus is on the cross again with thousands of crucified Palestinians around him. It only takes people of insight to see the hundreds of thousands of crosses throughout the land. Palestinian men, women and children being crucified. Palestine has become one huge Golgotha. The Israeli government crucifixion system is operating daily. Palestine has become the place of the school. That is a professing Christian preaching that sermon. 2001. Question. What is Christian Palestinianism? Well, I unpack this a little bit more in some of the booklets that you'll find out on the tables. But just to give you a very, uh, something to, to hold on to for this session. It is the denial by Christians, I'm not talking about Palestinian Christians, any Christian that the state of Israel today is legitimate and biblical, has anything to do with Israel in the Bible. A Christian Palestinianist denies that, says the state of Israel coming into existence in 1948 was a political accident, a catastrophe, Nakba, for the Palestinian people. A Christian Palestinianist declares that they are on the pursuit for justice. That's the buzzword, justice for the Palestinians. Now, if you ask a Christian what they think about the 14th of May, 1948, you'll know exactly where they stand or where they fall down. Somebody tell me what's significant about the 14th of May, 1948. David Ben-Gurion declared in Tel Aviv the independence of a new sovereign state called Israel. And from that moment on, the Arab nations tried and have tried and are continuing to try to destroy that nation. Here is what I've called the champion of Christian Palestinianism. He is an English evangelical vicar, member of the Evangelical Alliance, Stephen Sizer. His church is Christ Church, Virginia Water, in Surrey, uh, in the Guildford area, the Guildford Diocese. There's a picture of Sizer in 2007 in Tehran, in Iran, before the cameras of the Islamic Republic news agency. What was our evangelical vicar doing in Tehran five years ago? Was he preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ? No. 
he was defending Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, president of Iran, who in 2005 convened a conference, the World Without Zionism Conference, in which he declared to the world, Israel must be wiped off the map. What was Stephen Sizer saying in front of the cameras? He was defending Ahmadinejad against the accusations made against him by Zionists, by the Jewish people, and by Christian Zionists, Christians that stand with Israel. Stephen Sizer's PhD thesis was published in 2004. It's called Christian Zionism Roadmap to Armageddon, in which he hammers Christians like myself, and I hope most of you, if not all of you, Christians who, based on your understanding of the Word of God, know that God has not finished with Israel, God has not replaced Israel with the church, that the Lord God is restoring Israel, and one day when Jesus returns, Israel won't be the least, they won't be the most despised of the nations, they will be the chief among the nations. There's Stephen Sizer's church in Virginia Water. 2007, Stephen Sizer produced a more popular book, Zion's Christian Soldiers. The Bible, Israel, and the church with a foreword um, or a sermon by the late John Stott, a very well-known English evangelical scholar. John Stott was in the Christian Palestinian camp, had no understanding of Israel. Here is Stephen Sizer promoting his book on a tour of Iran in 2007. There he is receiving gifts from these Islamic ladies. Now what's the problem there? The problem there is the lady on the left, the elderly lady presenting him with these gifts, is a, a woman by the name of Zara Mostafavi Khomeini. The name Khomeini may ring bells with some of you. Khomeini, that is the name of the Ayatollah Khomeini. That is the Ayatollah Khomeini's daughter. Who was the Ayatollah Khomeini? In 1979, he's the guy that basically instigated the Islamic revolution in Iran that overturned the Shah of Iran and brought Islam, this Islamic revolution, throughout the Middle East. And that is what you're seeing before your very eyes on the TV today, the so-called Arab Spring. Zara Khomeini has also translated Stephen Sizer's book into Farsi, which is the Persian language. I'm told that is the first evangelical book to be translated into the Iranian language. And that will tell you something of the influence of Sizer. There is Sizer in Lebanon, 2008, giving a copy of his book to this uh, Islamic cleric. There's a photograph in the background of Hassan Nasrallah. Who is he? He's the head of Hezbollah, the Lebanese terrorist organization that is also with Hamas seeking to destroy Israel. There is Stephen Sizer in Libya, 2008, at a second meeting of the Evangelical Christian Muslim Dialogue. Christian Palestinianism is interfaith. You've got Evangelical Christians who proclaim to stand on the Word of God and believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, sharing platforms with Islamic scholars. They have nothing in common. Islam has nothing whatsoever in common with Christianity. But these guys have something in common. What do they have in common? A hatred of Israel. You remember Pontius Pilate? You remember King Herod? Were they friends before the trial and crucifixion of Jesus? No, they hated one another. But they came together to get rid of the Lord. And these men are coming together. Caesar is coming together with these guys in the name of the Lord to put pressure on Israel, to condemn Israel, to attack Israel. There's Caesar joined by a couple of other professing evangelical Ministers, Presbyterians, Gary Burge, you're going to see more of him later, and Donald Wagner. And there's the three of them in Toronto, Canada, May 2010, at a conference sponsored by the World Islamic Call Society. Who founded the World Islamic Call Society? Colonel Gaddafi, you may recognize his name. Colonel Gaddafi was no friend of Israel. Islam is no friend of Israel, and this is not an anti-Islamic, anti-Muslim presentation. I'm just giving you the facts. Some of you may have watched this debate that was televised by Revelation TV between Stephen Sizer and Calvin Smith, head of King's Evangelical Divinity College. 
the theme of the debate was, has the church replaced Israel? A Christian Palestinianist, like Caesar, believes that the church has replaced Israel, even though when you confront them with that question, they deny it. No, the church has not replaced Israel, the church has fulfilled Israel. They don't like being tagged, they don't like being labelled. Stephen Sizer won that debate hands down, in my opinion. And uh, I think that's confirmed by the fact that you can watch the debate on Stephen Sizer's website, which I took this slide from. You don't put your debate on a website if you lost it, wanting your friends and thousands to, 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 to watch your defeat. Now, Stephen Sizer was very, very happy at the end of uh, that debate. Revelation TV, who I don't necessarily endorse, were not particularly happy with the outcome of that debate. This is how Stephen Sizer began. Yet they, they both had seven minutes each, and this is, was his opening salvo. Who are God's chosen people? He asked, and then he gave his answer. The assumption that the Jewish people are God's chosen people is so deeply ingrained that to question it sounds heretical or anti-Semitic. To question that the Jews, to question that Israel is God's chosen people, sounds heretical, sounds anti-Semitic. The reason why it sounds heretical and it sounds anti-Semitic is because it is heretical and it is anti-Semitic. But what he is trying to do is question what you have thought or what you have been taught. That somehow God has a special purpose, a special place for Israel. Stephen Sizer has recently been, been under invest, recently been under investigation by Surrey police. A complaint was made against him by the Council of Christians and Jews based on his Facebook page. 4th of October last year, this was Stephen Sizer's Facebook page with a link to this website, the Ugly Truth website. Here is one of many captions. I don't recommend you go on this website because it is anti-Semitic through and through. If you can see from the back there, there's a, a caption, a cartoon of Homer Simpson going, woohoo! Why is he celebrating? Why is he jumping for joy? Because the headline on the Ugly Truth website, 11th of November 2011, was this. A Holocaust denier is set for a key role in the Greek government. A Holocaust denier is set for a, a key role in the Greek government. Government. Why would an evangelical vicar be putting a link to this website on his Facebook page, inviting his friends to come and view it? Now, Surrey police have exonerated Stephen Sizer. I think they've made a grave mistake because the charges are stacked against him. Stephen Sizer's material is found on Holocaust-denying websites, neo-Nazi websites. He shares platforms with men who have denied there was such a thing as the Holocaust. You don't know what the Holocaust was. It was the annihilation of at least six million Jews. For one reason, they were Jewish. That happened in the reign of Adolf Hitler. Stephen Sizer, in May this year, just a couple of months ago, was on a tour of New Zealand. It was called the With God on Our Side Tour. It was sponsored by Tear Fund. How many of you here have heard of Tear Fund? A Christian humanitarian organization Groups like Tear Fund, Christian Aid, World Vision, they are on the anti-Israel, pro-Palestinian bandwagon. So Tear Fund organized the With God on Our Side tour. With God on Our Side was a DVD documentary. You can buy it. I've got a copy. I've watched it. came out in 2010, hammering Christian Zionists, hammering Christians that stand, as I said before, on the word of God concerning Israel. And Stephen Sizer was one of the main consultants and interviewees on that documentary. This is what Tear Fund New Zealand had to say. Their executive director, Steve Tollestrup. We stand with the Palestinian people as a whole project for Tear Fund. We see Christian Zionism as an attack on orthodoxy. In other words, it's heretical. To believe that God hasn't finished with Israel, to believe that Jesus is coming back to Jerusalem to set up the kingdom of Israel and rule and reign on the, upon the earth as heretical, according to Tear Fund's executive director. 
Shortly afterwards, Stephen Sizer was uh, interviewed on this Christian television um, program, Shine TV. And I'm going to show you a 30-second clip. Listen very carefully. The words will come thick and fast. Propaganda. He's trying to get things in your head that you'll attach with Israel. For the last 50, 60 years, Israel has been ethnically cleansing the Palestinian territories, demolishing homes on a daily basis, uh, building illegal settlements on other people's land, creating an apartheid structure system of separate roads, separate schools, separate healthcare systems, uh, keeping the Palestinian three million people under military occupation for decades. And we're surprised that they resist that, uh, or they treat uh, Israel uh, in, in, uh, you know, as, as the enemy. We're surprised that they resist that. We're surprised that Palestinians strap explosives on their bodies, get on board a bus, and destroy as many Jewish people as they possibly can. We're surprised that they would do that. Did you get the words? Illegal occupation, military occupation, ethnic cleansing, apartheid state. You see what he's trying to do? He's trying to attach words that are universally abhorrent and associated with South Africa apartheid, genocide in Rwanda, the Balkans. He's trying to get you to attach those words to Israel so that you will rise in your spirit and you'll do something about the so-called occupation of Palestine. Bethlehem 2012, March this year. Uh, let me introduce you again to Gary Burge, American Presbyterian minister who was with Sizer, as you saw on one of those slides. Uh, that is Evangelical Muslim uh, Dialogue Conference conference in Tripoli a few years ago. Okay, we'll try that again. I'm standing on a rooftop in Bethlehem, and we are beginning to form the, the basis of an incredible conference in 2012, March 2012. There are going to be students gathering here, hundreds of evangelical leaders from the United States and around Europe. And what we want to do is convene here in Bethlehem and raise the question, what do we make of the occupation of the West Bank under Israeli control, and what should the Christian church in the West say to it? We hope that you're going to join us with hundreds of others to uh, create what is going to be perhaps the most important international gathering of Christians in 2012. That's a big statement, isn't it? Perhaps the most important gathering of Christians in 2012 in Bethlehem. Do you hear the term West Bank? West Bank doesn't exist. That's a reference to the West Bank of Jordan. You and I should know it as Judea and Samaria, because that's what we read in the Scripture. The West Bank is a politically loaded term. Here's Gary Burge saying, we're going to bring a load of students over. Now, I was there at this conference in Bethlehem, prayed with my pastor, he felt I should go there because I've written on this subject, I've met these people in the past and felt the Lord wanted me to go there to see with my own eyes here, with my own ears, what these guys were doing, what they were saying, what they were planning and as I'll share at the end, I've written a document, it's called Christ at the Checkpoint or the Church at Christ Checkpoint, you can get a copy of that and find out who was there, I'm going to tell you a little bit about that um, in, the, in the second part of this session. The Christ at the Checkpoint conference. To get into Bethlehem, you have to go through a checkpoint that's manned by Israeli soldiers. There's a huge wall that's set, that goes all around Bethlehem. Jewish people can't enter without special permits. It is under Palestinian control. Now, why is there a wall? People like Gary Burge call it the apartheid wall because it's separating the Palestinians from the Israelis or from one another. Why is there a wall? There is a wall because, as I've already said, Jewish people were being blown up on buses, they were being taken out by a Palestinian sniper fire that was coming from Bethlehem. This is a consequence of your actions. It might be a small minority of the Palestinian, Palestinian community that did this. That is the consequence. They will defend, Israel will defend its own people. And hardship results for the Palestinian community. Christ at the checkpoint was a way of these evangelicals saying Jesus is right there in Bethlehem and he can see what the Israelis are doing to the Palestinians. 
And so we as evangelicals, we're going to gather in Bethlehem, the place where Jesus was born, and we are going to stand and we're going to proclaim a different message to the one that the church has been taught for centuries about God's purposes for Israel. The conference was convened in this palace. You often hear how much poverty there is in the Palestinian territories, and there is. There are serious uh, poverty issues. It's not as bad as it is made out through the media. The media is very selective. The media is very anti-Israel. And remember who controls the media? Satan, prince of the power of the air, who seeks to destroy Israel. Five-star hotel. That's where we met. 600 people from all around the world. The intercontinental Jassir Palace. These are the views outside your, your, your windows. There's swimming pools and all the rest of it. There's the wall with a lot of graffiti about revolution. There's the checkpoint going out of Bethlehem on the way to Jerusalem. And there is Gary Burge by the wall in Bethlehem. You can probably read what is written behind him. Partite state. He's making a huge statement as to what he thinks about the wall in Bethlehem and about the state of Israel. There's Stephen Sizer, our evangelical vicar, just outside the conference center. There he is with the vice president of World Vision, so-called Christian organization, and Muntha Isaac, Palestinian director of the conference. And here is Stephen Sizer a couple of years ago at the first of these conferences with his British passport passing through the checkpoint. That's where the conference was. I'm around here somewhere off camera. And the conference began with a speech by the Prime Minister of the Palestinian Authority, a guy called Dr. Salam Fayyad, who began by saying, Welcome to Palestine. Now, that statement has got to do something to us. If it's not doing anything to us, if we're not bothered by that term Palestine, something is missing. And maybe the Lord tonight would want to just begin that journey in your heart, in your understanding as to what is going on in the Middle East. Palestine does not exist biblically. It does exist historically. It goes right back to the Roman Emperor Hadrian in AD 135 thereabouts, who tried to break all Jewish connection with the land of Israel, and so he renamed Israel Syria Palestina. And he got the word Palestina from the biblical Old Testament word, Philistine. Who were the Philistines? They were the arch enemies of Israel. He even renamed Jerusalem and called it Elia Capitolina. Elia being his middle name. And that word Palestine stuck for centuries. Well, the Prime Minister of the Palestinian Authority was followed onto the platform. Remember where we are. We're in Bethlehem. This is a conference, supposedly evangelical. It's been organized by Bethlehem Bible College, the only evangelical college in the Palestinian territories. So just keep the context in mind. We then have a speech by this man, Victor Battese, the mayor of Bethlehem, Roman Catholic who at one point refers to the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus and then makes this statement. We, the Palestinian people, are also crucified now. He's then followed onto the platform by this man, Dr. Hannah Issa. He is the, the director of the Christian Muslim Committee for Protecting the Holy Sites in Jerusalem. Dr. Hannah Issa declares, Jerusalem is under occupation and the Palestinian people are under siege. Okay, so any Christian message coming out of the, the Prime Minister, the Mayor, Hannah Issa so far? Well, Hannah Issa then brought greetings to this 600 plus evangelical, evangelical gathering, brought greetings in the name of this man. You saw him earlier. Remember, Jesus and his mother Mary were Palestinians par excellence, the Grand Mufti in of, of Jerusalem. Now, he got into trouble at the beginning of this year because in January 2012, at the 47th anniversary of the founding of Fatah, which is the leading Palestinian party, Mahmoud Abbas is the head of Fatah, he made some rather inflammatory 
comments. And you're going to watch what happened at the Fatah ceremony. This is Palestinian Media Watch. You can see a lot of videos like this on the internet showing what took place at that ceremony. And we are being brought greetings in the name of this man. Okay. Well, I've just jumped ahead there, but I'm going to get to the video clip. P.A. Mufti, Muslims' destiny is to kill Jews. He's quoting the hadith, the tradition that goes back to Muhammad, founder of Islam, saying that at the end of days before the great Islamic resurrection, when Islam takes over the world, even the trees will shout out, O Muslim, servant of Allah, there is a Jew behind me, come and kill him. This is the Grand Mufti, the head of Islam in Jerusalem, and we're being greeted as Christians in his name. What spirit is at work at a conference like the Christ at the Checkpoint Conference? Are you hearing from the Holy Spirit? Is this those who have ears to hear, hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to the churches? Is that the voice of the Holy Spirit? Is that the voice of the Lord Jesus? And we're going to stay here. Sorry, I'm jumping ahead. This is Sheikh Mohammed Hussein's predecessor. I'm going back to the Second World War. This is Hajimin Hal Husseini, Grand Mufti of Jerusalem in Hitler's era, on a visit to Berlin. What is he doing on that visit? He is urging Adolf Hitler who has a plan to exterminate all world Jewry, the entire world population of Jews, beginning with the population in Europe. He's encouraging to go beyond Europe and destroy all Jews in the Middle East. You can watch footage of him with the Heil Hitler salute, inspecting uh, Hitler's armies. So why is our evangelical vicar, very proud, all smiles, having his photograph taken with the Grand Mufti today, Sheikh Mohammed Hussein, who just quoted from Islamic Hadith text? Well, Stephen Sizer is not averse to having his photograph taken with rather controversial people, controversial is putting it mildly, people that have sworn to destroy Israel, like Yasser Arafat the late Yasser Arafat. I was at this conference, it's called the Sabeel, 5th International Sabeel Conference. You can listen to the testimony and get the report on the tables. So I was in that room, Chairman Arafat, President of the Palestinians, wanted his photograph with every single member of that conference delegation. I wasn't there as a supporter of Sabeel. Again, the Lord took me there to see what was going on and write about it and research it. All smiles, arms around each other. This man is responsible for the blood of thousands of Jewish people. He is the man who invented suicide bombings. He is the arch-terrorist, or he was. What is he doing there in that photograph? There is a spirit at work within the church of Jesus Christ, within the evangelical Church of Jesus Christ. It is an anti-Semitic spirit. It is an anti-Christ spirit. It is the spirit of Satan using men who profess Jesus to be their Lord and Savior. The big lie just keeps getting 
bigger. What do I mean by the big lie? I've got it in inverted commas. It's attributed to this man, Joseph Goebbels, propaganda minister under Adolf Hitler in the 1940s, who is quoted as saying, if you tell a lie big enough, apartheid Israel, and keep repeating it, ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian people, people will eventually come to believe it, Palestinians are under military occupation. The Christ at the Checkpoint Conference in Bethlehem this year took place during Israeli Apartheid Week. Anybody heard of Israeli Apartheid Week? Did you know this was going on? Saw one hand. All over the world, Albuquerque, Basel, Switzerland, Beirut, Birmingham, Bogota, Bordeaux, Edinburgh, Liverpool, Sydney, Toronto, Pittsburgh, Vancouver, Zurich, all over the world, Manchester, Marseille, New York City. Demonstrations in these major cities of the world condemning Israel and calling for the boycott of Israeli goods, the boycott of vegetables, the vo boycott of fruit, the boycott of anything that is produced in the so-called illegal Israeli settlements in Palestinian territory. This is the campaign that is going on right now to call for the boycott and the divestment and sanctions against Israel. And Stephen Sizer, our evangelical vicar, is at the forefront of this campaign. He's a member of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign. There you go, one of their captions. Don't buy into the Israeli occupation. The World Council of Churches in 2009 called for an international boycott of goods produced in the illegal Israeli settlements in the occupied territories. 2002, they sent out this document to all their member churches, end the illegal occupation of Palestine. Who were the World Council of Churches? Formed in 1948, very interesting, a couple of months after Israel was formed. They are the largest ecumenical Christian organization in the world, representing over 350 church denominations and associated groups. The World Council of Churches has never been a friend of Israel. The Methodist Church in our country, the Methodist Church of Great Britain, at their conference, June 2010, passed a resolution to support the campaign to boycott Israel. This is what they said. We are taking this particular action in response to requests from Palestinian Christians and the World Council of Churches and a growing number of Jewish organizations both inside Israel and worldwide. Some of Israel's greatest enemies are its own people. Recently, last month in America, the Presbyterian Church USA, one of the biggest mainstream denominations in America, voted to boycott Israeli goods. In other words, they're calling on all their members not to buy Israeli products, not to um, invest in Israeli companies, and so on. Right, I'm going to take you to London, to Tesco. It's March 2011. We're in the Tesco Superstore. All right, okay. Free Palestine! Free Palestine! Free Palestine! Free Palestine! shown you footage outside Marks and Spencers in Edinburgh. I could have shown you footage in Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide. I'm going to show you another clip in a moment. This is happening all over the place. Now, not all these people are Christians. 
but Christians are involved in this campaign to boycott Israel. You heard the one lady who had the very high pitch shouting very loudly. She was Jewish. I, I find that really hard to reconcile, but sadly that is sin. That is what sin will do. It doesn't matter who you are, sin will cause you, rebelling against God will cause you to do that which is not right in God's sight. Okay, we're going to go to Tom's neck of the woods now, because Tom is he's the, the president of the Breen Call, and that is based in Bend, Oregon, state of Oregon, town of Bend. On a short trip away is Portland. I flew into Portland to go to Tom's conference, and I flew out of it. This is May 2011 in a town in Portland. What are you doing? Just shopping. You can't buy those. Why not? Because those products support Israeli apartheid. Oh no! was saying just the same thing 80 years ago. He wasn't dancing in a supermarket. I've heard his name mentioned already. In einem kühlen und grandiosen Schwung haben wir die Feinde des Landes zu Paaren getrieben. Um 10 Uhr hat der Bagot begonnen. Er wird bis um die Mitternachtstunde fortgesetzt. Er vollzieht sich mit einer schlagartigen Wucht, aber auch mit einer imponierenden Manneszucht und Disziplin unserer Partei und unser Führer. Heil! Adolf Hitler did when he came to power in 1933 was to instruct Joseph Goebbels, his propaganda minister, to call for a nationwide boycott of Jewish goods, Jewish shops, Jewish businesses. The Holocaust began with a call to boycott Jewish goods. B -b -b boycott. Support the boycott. They have no idea 
what they're doing. And Christians are involved in this. They have no idea what they are doing, who they are messing with. Now Satan is messing with them. Satan has got them on, a, on an agenda, on a crusade, and they have no idea where that is going to take them. And I'll tell you where it's going to take them. Not because I'm clever, not because I'm their judge. I'm not. I pray for these people. I pray earnestly, sincerely, for people like Stephen Sizer and those who are under him. These people are on a collision course with Almighty God. And it doesn't matter whether they call themselves Christians or not. Because they are not speaking in the name of Jesus Christ. That is not the work of the Holy Spirit that you've been watching in these clips. Oh, people like to get on a cause. Young people like to get on a cause. Cause of justice. Cause for freedom. And at that Christ at the Checkpoint conference, there were lots of students, American students. And you know what I saw with the guys there? They were all wearing the kefir, the Palestinian headdress. You know, the black and white checkered scarf you saw Arafat wearing? Because it looks cool. They're part of a cause. If it ain't God's cause, don't be involved. Because a time will come when the Lord says, enough. I don't know what the Lord will do, but He will act. And so this is where we are. People on the streets, free Palestine. There's Christians on the streets, free Palestine. Boycott Israeli goods. That's where we were in 1933. And that's where things ended for the Jewish people. This is 1945. That is General Dwight D. Eisenhower with General Patton at a camp. What are they looking at? They're looking at the remains of Jewish people that were gassed and burnt, destroyed. For one reason, they were Jewish. Because that's the reason Adolf Hitler wrote in Mein Kampf. He laid it out from the beginning. That was his agenda. We praise the Lord that Israel is a state again. In unbelief, they have not recognized Jesus as the Messiah. And because of that, they are heading for the most horrific time in their history. It may not be gas chambers, it may not be piles of burning bodies, but it's going to be an awful time for the Jews. The Jews have faced Adolf Hitler, but they have yet to face the Antichrist. Adolf Hitler is a type of Antichrist, but he was not the Antichrist who is coming. This is what Dwight D. Eisenhower later became President of the United States said at the hors d'oeuvre camp, and this is a a memorial stone in Boston in America, the things I saw beg a description. The visual evidence and the verbal testimony of starvation, cruelty, and bestiality was so overpowering as to leave me a bit sick. I made the visit deliberately in order to be in a position to give first-hand evidence of these things. If ever in the future there develops a tendency to charge these allegations merely to propaganda. He's talking there about Holocaust deniers. That never really happened. There were never really six million Jews. And by the way, that is a conservative estimate. So what are evangelical Christians doing sharing platforms with Holocaust deniers when that is what happened to the people of Israel, the Jewish people, not that long ago? Oh, but but boycott. Support the boycott. So we're back in Bethlehem. Here are some of the speakers. Sizer, Gary Burge, Ben White, young English journalist. Absolutely rabid against Israel. Palestinian Salim Amnaya and Porter Speakman Jr., an American. He's the guy that produced the With God on Our Side DVD. I'm going to give you a couple of extracts from their messages. This is Colin Chapman, British evangelical theologian, 1983, wrote a book, Whose Promised Land? Question mark. Challenging the belief that the land of Israel belongs to the Jewish people. That book has been reprinted many times. That's had a massive impact in the church. This is what he said in Bethlehem a few months ago. I have begun to understand a little of the anger that led to 9-11. Remember the Twin Towers? Al-Qaeda. I have to say that if I were a Muslim... Let's just pause there. Colin, you're not a Muslim. You're supposed to be an evangelical Christian. Stop speaking for the Muslims. If I were a Muslim, 
If I were an Arab, I would feel some of this anger. And would have to add that in many cases, I believe they have good reason to be angry. Hmm, 9-11, there was good reason, was there? There's a couple of more speakers. Lynn Hybels, very influential American lady. She's the wife of Bill Hybels, founder of Willow Creek Community Church in Illinois in the United States. That church is one of the most, if not the most influential church in America. It's had a massive impact on churches in this country. She talked a lot about Muslim women and how they have resisted the so-called occupation. John Ortberg, pastor of a 4,000 church in California, very influential Christian writer. He tweeted, okay, those that do Twitter, I don't do Twitter, Facebook, or anything like that, but he tweeted that he'd had an unforgettable trip to the Christ at the Checkpoint Conference, and he was particularly inspired by the message given by Gary Burge. We've mentioned Gary Burge in this session. These are influential people. They are going back to their constituencies, their churches, their ministries. Their reports are going to have an impact on Christian minds, not for the good, but for the bad. There's Joel Hunter. Who's heard of Pastor Joel Hunter? No hand. Oh, I'm surprised. Joel Hunter is the pastor of a 15,000 megachurch in Florida. That's quite an influential position he's got. Okay. Well, there's millions of Christians in the world, 15,000. Joel Hunter is also the spiritual advisor to Barack Obama, President of the United States. Now, the reason why I'm telling you these things is to show you Remember what Gary Burge said? This could possibly be the most important Christian conference in 2012 when you've got people like this gathering in Bethlehem. You know something is building. Something very serious and, in my opinion, very sinister is happening. One of the most sinister things that happened, in my opinion, was the invitation that was extended to these three leaders of Messianic churches. These are Messianic Jews. That's Evan Thomas, pastor of a Messianic fellowship in Israel. That's Wayne Hillsden, pastor of King of Kings Church in Jerusalem, very well known. This is Richard Harvey, president of the British Messianic Jewish Alliance, used to work with Jews for Jesus. These men were invited to share the platform in Bethlehem. And they came on their own. They didn't come on behalf of their organizations or ministries because their ministries said, don't go. Don't go to this conference, but they went. Now, Wayne Hilsden gave a very good speech. It was very biblical. It was based on the covenants of God with Israel. The problem was, halfway through, he stopped in his message and said to Gary Burge, Gary, I really enjoyed your message. It was really good what you said on this point. We need to talk. I think we're on the same page. I had an opportunity to speak with Wayne. He came up to me. I'd never met him before. He'd never met me. And I said, Wayne... Do you understand where Gary Burge is coming from? Gary Burge believes Israel's finished. The church is the new Israel. There is no future for the nation of Israel. But the most disturbing presentation of the entire conference was Richard Harvey. And I know especially some of the grown-ups will know his name. A Messianic Jew. His members of his family went through some of the camps during the Holocaust. Richard Harvey just gave this philosophical, psychological presentation. It was just a bit over your head. Partway through, he stops. And he says, Stephen Sizer, if you're here and I count you a friend, and then he turns to Ben White, who I mentioned, the young journalist, who wrote a book, Israeli Apartheid, A Beginner's Guide. And Ben White, if you're here too, I count you a friend. Capitulating, compromising, getting carried away in the flesh because he was warmly received as a Jewish guy. Warmly received and that pulled, I'm sure that pulled on his heartstrings. And at the end, and you can go on the Christ at the Checkpoint website and you can watch all these presentations and you can see what happened when Richard Harvey finished. He got a standing ovation. As people were standing to applaud him, he broke down in tears. As he broke down in tears, the Palestinian leaders who had organized the conference came up to him. And you can watch him nestling his head into their chest, weeping and sobbing. As soon as I saw Richard do that, and I was there, I wasn't watching this, I'm saying, you can watch it. I thought, 
He's in serious trouble. He has been brought into a viper's nest. No discernment whatsoever. He's had the flesh pulled within him. And he's not listening to the voice of the Spirit. And I borrowed Tom and Dave Hunt's the title of their, their book in the, in the 80s, The Seduction of Christianity, and called it The Seduction of Messianic Christianity. You see, what many of these speakers did, especially the Palestinian speakers did from the platform, was say this. We love the Jews. We've been to Auschwitz. We've been to Yad Vashem. We've seen the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Jerusalem. We want a dialogue. We want reconciliation. We want to listen. But in the same breath, they're saying, we hate Israel. We don't recognize Israel's right to exist. We believe we should boycott Israel. We, should, we believe we should petition our governments and call on the United Nations to condemn Israel and impose sanctions on Israel. You see, you can't love the Jewish people and hate Israel, the state of Israel. You can't do that. And this man was the, the keynote speaker. You may know his name. I can tell from the reaction. Some of you have heard of Tony Campolo, Baptist, ordained minister, professor of sociology at um, Eastern University, St. David's, Pennsylvania. Very controversial figure. Was tried unofficially in the 80s for heresy. For declaring that Jesus is in, Jesus is in everyone. Well, I'm just going to give you one extract from what he said. And I hope it disturbs you. And I know, hope you know why it disturbs you. Because he's not going to say anything here about Israel, the Jewish people, boycott. But I'm going to show you this ex extract to, to demonstrate what is feeding in. You might remember last year, those that he, last year, and I was talking about the battle for the mind and Christian music and stuff like that. Yeah, it went down like a lead balloon with some people because it touched a nerve. Some Christ, young Christians are following the Christian, so-called Christian bands. The lyrics might be great, but there is an influence with the music. You've got to know where people are at. So there's a lot of music in the church today that's come out of Toronto or Pensacola. It's come out of a, a reservoir that is unclean. It's contaminated by wrong practice and wrong teaching. And I'm going to show you what is feeding into this whole movement. Christian Palestinianism. This is Tony Campolo. I do understand the kind of praying, he said, where you say nothing and you hear nothing, but in quietness and stillness, you center down on Christ. Is that what you do? Is that what Jesus said in, in the Sermon on the Mount when you pray? You center down on me? Center down? Okay, anybody heard of the emerging church? It smells and bells, it's prayer labyrinths, it's Forget doctrine, let's, let's have a conversation, let's not be interested in truth anymore. Yeah, he's part of the emerging church movement where you center down. It's all meditation, it's all contemplation. Drawing from monks and Celtic spirituality and all the rest of it. But then he went on to say, and then you wait patiently for the spirit to flow in and to envelop you and penetrate you and saturate you with his or her Presence. Okay. Now, I heard that, and I felt like shouting. I felt so grieved. I didn't, because that wouldn't have been right. But I left that meeting, I, I, I was praying all the way back to my room, and in my room I just sobbed, because I felt so indignant. How dare he talk? So-called Christian minister, talk about the Holy Spirit in that way, as a her, a he or a she. Hang on a minute, you're playing with the Holy Spirit here. What was the reaction of all the other 600 evangelicals? Oh, they were in stitches. Uproar, the laughter. They loved it. He was playing with them because he's a very powerful, charismatic figure. He is a powerful figure. There are men who are in churches today who are powerful. In other words, when they speak, you listen to them. But the power is not necessarily a good power. There is a power at work through men like Tony Campolo. I'm not judging where he stands with the Lord. There's a power at work through him. And men like Campolo and Lynn Hybels and those that were at this conference, they all talked about people that had influenced them in their Christian walk. 
writings that had inspired them. And they talked about being inspired by Ignatius of Loyola. Who was he? Founder of the Jesuits. The Roman Catholic stormtroopers ask Tom about the Jesuits. Mother Teresa, Roman Catholic nun. People in the church get endeared to Mother Teresa. She didn't say Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life. Gandhi, Hindu pacifist. Karl Barth, a Swiss theologian. Maimonides, a Jewish sage. Hanan Ashrawi, a Palestinian politician. Martin Luther King Jr., civil rights leader, who I was told in America by a, a respectable Christian leader was, uh, um, yeah, jumped in and out of bed with, with women. Desmond Tutu, South African Archbishop, Martin Buber, Jewish philosopher, Thomas Merton, a Trappist monk. These evangelicals are influenced by these people. Well, Jack Sara, Vice President of Bethlehem Bible College, he concluded, I'd like you to open your Bibles because we're going to read what he read from. Please turn to Ezekiel chapter 37 and we're, we're nearly at the end now. Ezekiel chapter 37, it's the Valley of the Dry Bones vision. So I want you to follow in your Bible and listen to Jack Sara as he's reading out. Ezekiel chapter 37. You ready? All there? No! Or was that a cat? Did a cat just walk in? <laughs> Ezekiel 37, Jack Sara, closing the conference. Here we go. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of the West Bank. Bethlehem, Calchilia, and Janine, and Salvit, and Nablus, and Ramallah. It was full of bones. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? Can the Palestinian people live? You see, the Palestinian people were, and a lot are still, like this valley of dry bones, that is in need of the church to come and prophesy life on them. And I think through the Christ at the Checkpoint Conference, there was a lot of prophesying life over the Palestinian people. That's what he did with the Word of God at the end of his presentation. So, in conclusion, Christian Palestinianism is... Bearing false witness to Christ. Jesus said to his disciples, Acts 1, You shall be my witnesses. In other words, you shall speak the truth about me and you shall represent me. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. Christian Palestinianism, those caught up in it, Stephen Sizer, Tony Campolo, Gary Burge, all those we've looked at, is seriously damaging the church's witness to the Jewish people by what they are saying and what they are doing. Ethnic cleansing, apartheid state, b -b -b boycott, support the boycott. And Christian Palestinianism is a diseased tree which will be cut down. Not because I say so, not because I'm going to cut it down, because I'm nobody but because this is a tree, I've likened it to a tree, and it's bearing fruit all the time. This is some of the fruit. These are the books that these guys we've talked about tonight are writing, filling Christian bookshops. You can get them on their websites, all using this inflammatory language. And as with any tree, there is a root system, and you've got to check out the root system. Where's their theology of Israel rooted in? We've got no time whatsoever to go into this. But I'm going to flag up names. I'm going to flag up terms to show you what it's all rooted in theologically. In other, in other words, how they understand, interpret the Bible. It goes back to Augustine in the 4th century. who came up with replacement theology. The church has replaced Israel. Amillennialism came from Augustine. In other words, Israel is not going to be restored as a nation. Jesus isn't returning to planet Earth. Calvinism. Calvin got all his doctrine from Augustine. So did Luther. Liberation theology. We looked at that. Jesus is the powerless Palestinian. Thousands of Palestinians being crucified today. 
Gary Burge doesn't like replacement theology, neither does Stephen Sizer, so they've come up with a new term, fulfillment theology. Jesus is Israel. When Jesus was on the cross, he was Israel. Jesus is the temple. Jesus is Jerusalem. Jesus is the land of Israel. God isn't in interested in a, a nation anymore and a piece of land that the Bible called Israel. And I've summed it all up under this term, Christian Palestinianism. Let's change the metaphor. Well, Matthew 7, 16 to 19. Jesus said, you will recognize them by their fruits. You've seen a lot of that fruit tonight. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear, bad, bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And that's why I, I confidently say, one day. Whenever, however the Lord chooses to do it, this will fall. There will be a judgment, and that's why we've got to pray. Lord, rescue people. That's why you have got to stand. You have got to be a true witness, not with anger, not with aggression, not say, b -b -b boycott, boycott the Palestinians. No, not respond to evil with evil, but respond with truth and with grace. Changing the metaphor. Here we are in Jerusalem at the Wailing Wall. We've got these Orthodox Jewish men have been wailing for many, many years, longing for the Messiah to come, longing for the restoration of Israel as promised by the prophets. What are they reading on this wall? If the church could write a message on this wall, what would that message be? Well, the Christian Palestinians have been writing on this wall with their own graffiti. I've called it evangelical graffiti. And you've heard some of the expressions. Apartheid state, ethnic cleansing, genocide, Israeli occupation, Zionism is racism, the church is the new Israel, Israeli government crucifixion system, crucified Palestinians, Jesus is Israel, and Jesus was a Palestinian. That has got to stir us. That has got to get us on our knees before the Lord. That has got to get us in the Word of God. That has got to get us standing against this and for the truth in the name of Jesus Christ. And you and I are not going to, we're not going to cut this tree down. We're not going to destroy this movement. That's not our place. I've got enough issues in my life to deal with. And so have you. But the Lord calls for people to stand. Even if you don't ever see any results. You don't ever see any fruit. Okay, I'm just going to... I'm going to get on this chair. Hopefully my head doesn't go through the roof. I'm in a court right now. I'm in God's court. God has called me to the stand. And He's called me to be a witness for Jesus Christ. He's called me to speak what His Word declares. He's called me to represent who Jesus is. And part of doing that is saying, my Jesus, my Lord, my Savior, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Son of God, Messiah, is a Jew. He is not a Palestinian. He loves the Palestinians. He loves the Muslims. He loves the Buddhists. He loves the Hindus. He loves the whole world. But you and I have got to stand as weak and as feeble as we can even if you don't change anybody's mind. Stand in the sight of God so that He can see you, young and old, male and female, saying, I'm going to stand for the truth. I am going to love Israel. God is going to judge Israel. God is going to deal with Israel because of their rejection of the Messiah. I'm not called to judge Israel. Neither is the church. The church is called to love Israel. The church is called to witness for Jesus Christ to Israel. The church is called to make Israel jealous. Is this going to make Israel jealous? Are the Jews going to see the, the real Jesus? In these books, on their blogs, and their websites, in their campaigns, their manifestos? No. But the Lord wants to see me and the Lord wants to see you standing for the truth of God's Word. Because the Lord will honor you. The Lord will bless you. Even if you don't see it. Anybody change that you speak to. Even if this gets worse and worse and worse, and it will, that the Lord could look down and say, I see that little girl, or I see that young guy, or I see that couple, and they're standing for me. They're standing for my son. 
They're standing for my chosen people. While I was in Bethlehem, um, my pastor was led to a very well-known scripture. Many of you will recognize it straight away as we as a church were praying about this and asking the Lord to show us. This was the, the flyer. This was how they advertised the conference. And behold, the Lord stood upon a wall made by a plumb line with a plumb line in his hand. Amos 7, 7. The plumb line is his word. Put in the plumb line amongst the Christian Palestinians at the conference and saying, this isn't straight. This conference isn't built on a solid foundation. It's based on a crooked foundation, on wrong theology. And therefore, it cannot stand. It will fall. Two documents out there on the tables that a lot of this is based on tonight. Prophets who prophesy lies in my name. You can also get it on various websites. And the Church at Christ's Checkpoint. Final slide. Anybody tell me where that is? It's the Valley of Elah in Israel. That's once the brook from which David took five smooth stones. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 41. And the Philistine, this is Goliath, moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, looked down upon him, despised him in his heart. For he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me. And I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. And then David, the youth, said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. Lord Jesus, you are known in your word as the son of David, but you are also David's Lord, God and Savior. Lord Jesus, a lot of the material tonight is not very wholesome, Lord, and it makes us indignant. Lord, there's a lot to take in, but this is the reality of what's going on in the world, and we expect the world to behave in this manner. We expect the world to hate you, We expect the world to hate your people, Israel. But when the church is doing it, Lord, we know that we are in serious, serious times. And Lord, you have brought us together, even at Truth for Youth, for such a time as this. Not just to listen about Israel, but Lord, you're speaking to us about a whole range of issues that are important to you. Lord, you want us to be men and women of God, young and old, who are in a right relationship with you who are in a right place regarding the understanding of your word, and who are prepared to say, here I am, Lord, I'm sinful, I'm weak, I don't know what I can do for you, but Lord, I give you my life. Lord, if you can use me, Lord, please use me, send me out to be your witness, Lord Jesus, because I love you, Lord, because you died for me, because you bore my sin and the punishment I deserved on that cross. Oh, Lord Jesus, Lord, at the end of this day, please just just draw us closer to yourself. Lord, just give us greater understanding. Give us your mind. Help us by your Spirit to take things in and to act upon them. And Lord, we do pray for your mercy upon many of our brothers and sisters in Christ who are caught up in this error. 
who are doing things and they have no idea, Lord, what they're doing because of the deception. Lord, would you open their eyes and would you give us opportunities to be able to speak to people in love, in grace, but with boldness and in truth, the truth of your word. So Lord, we just commit this session and Lord, we just pray for your continuing protection and your blessing upon just the, the, the rest of the day and, and the coming days too. For we ask this in your name. Amen.